All right. Welcome everyone to the Build a Better Book webinar on a tactile art workshops with Rashika Kartik. And um, <laughs> we're really happy to have Rashika here today. She's done a lot for a, for a junior in high school. She's an extremely busy person. <laughs> and so we're really glad that she was able to fit, her, fit us into her schedule and share her um, experience and expertise. So just a little bit about Rashika. She is um, a high, high school junior at St. Mary's Academy in Colorado. And she is a creative activist. So she uses her art as a catalyst for justice, equality, and change. And over the past three years, she's worked with teachers and students for, with, with visual impairments across different uh, school districts in Colorado, the Colorado Center for the Blind, Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind, and the Anchor Center for the Blind, and the Braille Institute to create accessible um, art classes for students who are blind and visually impaired. So Rashika has been really busy in, and in January, she became the youngest president of the Colorado Tactile Art Club and conducts monthly art workshops through touch and works um, to create opportunities for blind students to explore their imagination and make accessible art. And um, since April, <clears throat> Rashika has been running the Tactile Art Club virtually and um, finding new ways to explore um, each art form and new mediums. She also, um, founded a project called Vision of the Artist's Soul, and as the youngest ever recipient of the 2020 Arts and Society grant. So if you're interested in um, finding more about her, we will post the link to Rachika's blog and you can read more about her. And I also wanted to mention that we have Anne Cunningham with us on the call and um, has worked with Rachika with the Tactile Art Club uh, through the Colorado Center for the Blind as well. So um, maybe we can, Anne can chime in <laughs> if she would like to also. So um, we're ha really happy to have you here, Rashika. And if you wanna go ahead and just talk about what you've been working on. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. So as uh, Gigi mentioned, my name is Rashika. I'm really thrilled to see all of you. I am a 16 year old from uh, Denver, Colorado. And today I want to be talking about my uh, journey with creating tactile art online. So let me just okay. get my screen here. Yeah. I'm very impressed that you nailed the pronunciation first try. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. yes. That's great. So how many of you have ever gone to a museum? Maybe used a coloring book? Or even yeah. seen a really cool painting in someone else's wall? These types of experiences are things that govern our social and academic life, all ways in which art organically manifests itself in our society. Yet sometimes this art form is primarily perceived in a visual way. We don't often have those same routine experiences with tactile art or multimedia art. And I think it's just as important to include every member of society in these sort of amazing experiences that make us who we are as a human population. That's why I was so passionate about starting accessible initiatives and uh, working with my community who have given me the tremendous opportunity uh, to work in this field. And today I'm going to talk about how art has um, influenced me as well as uh, how I go about creative activism or using art as a catalyst for change. So a little bit about um, my background. I initially, as a kid, I was always like interested in art and I, uh, was an artist by nature, although I wouldn't define myself that way. I think that art was always a way for me to connect with people and express my feelings through imagery. And it was a way that I could emotionally connect with myself as well in a way that other mediums did not often uh, lend themselves to. So these are a few examples of art that I started making uh, around two or three years ago and more current on the right uh, about social issues that I was seeing in my community. This is because I believe that art is a universal way of connecting. Every person has the beauty of coming from different languages, backgrounds, cultures, and other belief systems. But one thing that we have in common is emotion and the human experience. And I think no better medium expresses that than art. So here are two examples of um, artwork that I made about um, you know, social justice and things like that. And I've continued to develop that as I've go going along. However, traditionally, um, when I expressed interest in art in my childhood, 
I found that there is a very unidimensional perception of art, meaning there's a specific type of kid that was an artist and a specific type of medium that an artist would use. And I was not always that kind of kid who identified herself as someone in the art community. I just liked creating things that were uniquely my own. This is why I argue that every person can be an artist. Oftentimes people think that artists are some sort of, you know, creative genius or some sort of person with a paintbrush always in their hand. But I would argue that no one has the same experience as another person. And as such, we all are artists. Picasso once said, every child is an artist only the famous artists choose to continue letting that spirit flourish. And I think that that was perfectly said. I also think that, as I mentioned before, the scape of art was viewed very visually, meaning the focus of art when I was first learning was about the visual output. And while I think that's great, I think that it's one facet and not nearly as much of the experience. Traditionally, I had a lot of experience with two-dimensional mediums, such as, you know, like drawing, charcoal, pen, things like that. But now, um, thanks to the amazing opportunities that I've received uh, from my community, I've been able to expand this to tactile art and multimedia and understand art in a whole different way. And so um, I've also started experimenting with digital art, and I'm hoping to share how these two-dimensional mediums can be uh, transformed in three-dimensional ways in the future slides. So I would not be who I am today without my volunteer work journey. And uh, a little bit of information about that. I started in 2018 and I kind of came into this field as a blessing. So I really have to thank uh, all the people in the community for really fostering such an interest and passion of mine. Uh, when I came into the community about like two years ago, I was working with uh, some of the organizations listed here. And what I noticed that was so unique was the, the emphasis on human connection there. In very few places have I felt the same sense of community and belonging. And also it was my first experience in a place where I was not uh, cited. There are other aspects of my life when I have been um, kind of in the minority, but I think that I never really realized that uh, my visual capabilities could make me a majority. And uh, seeing the world from a way that wasn't visual was tremendously impactful for me. I recognize that um, when I speak about these sort of uh, topics such as tactile art, I do have to recognize that um, I am not visually impaired or blind myself. And so for that, I have to thank my community so much for letting me in and allowing me to continue learning and growing as a sighted person. And I know that I also have a long way to go. So um, in no means am I aiming to say something that applies for all people. I'm just talking about what has worked for me. So I started with uh, certain organizations in my local community. And then as I got um, more interested, I branched out to other um, organizations across the nation, such as Braille Institute in California and um, the NFB, which I'm a proud member of, and that's a national organization. I've also started working with teachers of students of visual impairment or TBIs across different school districts in Denver and Colorado Springs, because I found that the processes that um, a lot of schools that were targeted towards communities who have visual impairments were using were quite impactful. And yet we didn't see the same sort of uh, implementation when they were in in mainstream public schools. So my aim was to bring about that change as well. Now, what got started with my experience in uh, tactile art was Colorado Tactile Art Club. And for this, uh, I briefly want to shout out my mentor and like most inspiration, Anne Cunningham, who is on this call. Uh, she was the person who uh, really made me believe in myself in this field and the person who took a leap of faith and gave me all of these opportunities. She's also very talented in her own merit and one of the top people in her industry. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Anne, again, for always supporting and uh, feel free to add on to anything I'm saying in regards to tactile art. So initially we started Colorado Tactile Art Club when I became the president as a place where people of all ages and um, all visual capacities could come together and create art that was unique to them in different mediums. We really emphasized sort of an open studio format where each person would learn techniques that would help them grow as an artist, but it was really about the process. 
The key here is that our philosophy was about how people felt in the moment and what it did for them personally, rather than the end goal of the art, which still is phenomenal and probably way better than anything I could ever do. My students are very talented. But um, things that we also aim to do is explore new mediums um, that were accessible and engaging through touch. So for example, uh, with the um, first workshops we ever did, we did things like clay self-portraits and uh, works in clay. And this is a wonderful experience to bring people together and really form a community around this cause. I believe that tactile art is incredibly important because not only, as I mentioned earlier, does sort of art manifest itself in day-to-day -day life, but also art is so much more about than the end result. It's about the creativity and what it teaches you personally. In fact, unfortunately, currently, um, some statistics have said that um, close to 70% of the blind and visually impaired population is unemployed, which is deeply saddening to hear. Yet 72% of um, top employers and industry leaders state that creativity is the number one skill they look for in new employees which means that the lack of tactile art opportunities not only harms the um, sort of personal development of some students, but also their professional aspects and future ways as well. On the contrary, by enhancing these experiences and making it a focus um, by incorporating creativity in everyday life, um, people are able to find their individuality and really grow. And all this was going well, but then uh, came the pandemic. And during the pandemic, we really had to re-examine the way that we looked at tactile art because previously I had never heard about tactile art online and it was definitely a new domain. However, that certainly didn't stop us. And uh, we went online and got to make uh, beautiful art pieces from our homes. Now, I found some unexpected blessings through uh, this process. The first being that I think that the beauty of online is that it really broadens your audience. Previously, I only had uh, people in my community join that were uh, close to me and as such very geographically similar to me and transportation was oftentimes an issue for students. However, now with the online format, we've had students join from all around the nation and all around the world as well. Another great thing that I learned through this experience is that any sort of event is as much about the people attending as what we're doing. I think I've learned so much more um, than I've taught, quote unquote, at these sessions, just from hearing unique perspectives of people and by making it relationship centric rather than very focused on the task that we're doing, I find that we're um, a lot more fun and uh, we create a much more inclusive community. Another thing that uh, we have done that has made Tactile Art Club successful is I made it a huge priority for me that um, when I say that I want art to be accessible for all people, I mean all people, regardless of their ability, first of all, but also their financial status and their situation. So as best as we can, we tried to make all of the materials available from home and make the projects um, easily adaptable to all levels so that everyone felt like they could contribute. And here are some examples of the work that students have created. If you want to learn more about the specific projects we do or um, check out this community, I have put links as well, but I encourage you to visit uh, my Tactile Art Club blog on my website to learn about all of the things that we've done. Another thing that uh, I've gotten the opportunity to do is uh, create um, art studio sessions through the National Federation of the Blind. As I mentioned, I'm really happy to be a member there. And, uh, after attending monthly chapter meetings and seeing what people would be most interested in, um, we got to create uh, really nice ways to engage our community as well. For example, uh, me and Ann Cunningham did a art studio activity with pumpkin carving at the annual state convention. And that was a really great way to celebrate Halloween. Now, the other thing that I did after finding out the success of Tactile Art Club and the, seeing the participation skyrocket was that I knew that this was an area that people were interested in. This is an area that had potential and this is um, a place where the community really felt like they were thriving and I wanted to be a part of contributing to that. So I decided to expand my reach from just this place to incorporating similar models in a more formalized project. This is what inspired me to start Vision of the Artist's Soul. 
This is um, the project that won the 2020 Arts and Society Grant Award. And this is an after school tactile art program for students who are blind or low vision, visually impaired across Colorado. Uh, these workshops also have three phases to them. The first phase is very creativity based and open studio like, meaning students get materials and they get the chance to explore and kind of explore new um, techniques and discover their own artistic style on their own. We also have more formal classes where we'll delve into a specific medium or a specific art style and really teach students so that they can improve their art skills and learn more concretely how they can best advance. The other thing we do is we take art and we apply it to the more broad community, which means that sometimes we'll use art as a lens to examine different social issues or we'll use art as a lens to examine different academic concepts, such as um, science, literacy, things like that. And the beauty about this is that people can then use their creativity and apply it to other disciplines in their life. Finally, in this project, what has been hugely successful is partnering um, people in the community who are interested in learning tactile art with professional artists who um, have visual impairments or identify as blind and connecting with them to talk about the experience. I think that representation is extremely important and I was so happy that um, these artists um, gave me the opportunity to learn from them about their practices and how they have made a successful career using art that doesn't have a visual focus. And I think what that does is inspire students to um, reach for the stars and try their best as well. After that, we're also um, planning on uh, exhibiting their work. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I was planning on doing a public exhibit, but now I'm thinking of doing online galleries and that sort of thing to uh, showcase the talents of students. And then finally, we hope to address the effectiveness of the program by doing sort of a comprehensive review and seeing what changes we can implement in public schools and broader communities. So here are some examples of art projects that have really worked. I would categorize um, the kind of online tactile art I do in two boxes, if you will. The first is um, sort of more, how do I put this? Organic, I would say, in the sense that all the materials are from home. People can choose when they come and when they make the art. And uh, it's also uh, very easy to just join without any prior shipping or planning or things like that. And that's the primary setup we've used in Tactile Art Club. This includes using things such as tinfoil, salt dough, um, paper, and other materials that I wouldn't have dreamed of working with before this. The other side is more formal art classes where we do want students to explore with different materials and provide these materials to them. This is one such example. In Vision of the Artist Soul, I had the wonderful opportunity with working with talented guest artist Erin Schock at Braille Institute. And during this project, we made tactile collages with Mount Fuji. So in this process, she talked about her experience uh, working as an artist um, and her experience in Japan, as well as uh, kind of the history of the views of Mount Fuji. And we got to create our own uh, different views of Mount Fuji using different materials such as aluminum foil, uh, cotton balls, paper, and things like that. So here's some student examples. Another workshop that was um, great that students really enjoyed was multi-sensory tactile painting with guest artist John Bramblett. He is a world-renowned uh, blind painter and artist who aims to uh, teach children a way of redefining how we look at painting and thinking of art in a multi-sensory way. And so we had uh, this opportunity to introduce students to different types of textured paint and uh, students got to create their own artwork, as you see here. And finally, I also conducted a tactile art workshop at the Braille Institute which is one of the things where um, we use household materials and people could join uh, without any prior signup. And this, or not prior signup, but uh, prior shipping and things like that. And so we did botanical explorations with tinfoil. And uh, this was a place where people could create their own gardens to kind of symbolize their own personal growth or um, something that they loved. And then uh, we got to create a garden and have that sort of uh, relaxing and enriching experience as a community. So here are some things that students have done. 
I also wanted to branch out my work to museum accessibility and create workshops there because I believe that museums are a great way of preserving knowledge and teaching people in a hands-on way. And museums obviously should be accessible to all people. So I've started an initiative called Touch and Create Studios and this works with um, museums uh, that are local and museums that are national in order to create accessible workshops and programming. I've also had the tremendous opportunity uh, with Anne and other industry leaders to um, be part of a uh, museum accessibility committee at the National Federation of the Blind, where we talk about best practices and we hear from both blind and sighted people about what they believe uh, would be best ways to make museums more accessible. So one such example was my workshop with MCA Denver. With these tactile art workshops, um, again, we wanted to showcase the work of an artist that was visually impaired as well as um, learn about new disciplines. So we created uh, two such projects um, that I'm gonna share. The first was explorations in uh, sort of ceramics and clay. So we got to make uh, different styles of bowls and uh, decorate them with, um, as you see here, like um, multimedia and other um, techniques such as stamping, carving, things like that. And that was taught by uh, Marguerite Woods, who shared her story as how she became um, interested in sculpture um, as an individual who's blind. We also uh, did a great uh, workshop with raised line drawings from sculpture. And this is a particularly uh, interesting workshop for me because it takes um, a direct correlation between two dimensional art forms and what, um, sighted peers do and makes it accessible for people who are interested in those areas. So these uh, drawings uh, were uh, with the awesome artist Emily Gossio. And uh, what we did in this workshop was we were inspired by um, still lifes or any object in our homes. And we got to first um, tactilely describe the object and then uh, translate it onto paper using uh, raised line drawing techniques. Um, for raised line drawing, you can use a sensational blackboard, which was invented by Anne, or you can use what we did here, which was a rubber sheet with um, paper and ballpoint pen. And then after creating this raised line drawing, students got to color and decorate it with um, different crayons. And then finally used that drawing as a reference for their sculpture. This is also great because students got to mimic the process that professional artists do. So Emily walked us through um, how she did this for large installations and professional pieces. So what have I learned and what worked? I think the first thing that I learned that worked a lot is relying on the community. I think that when you have multiple brains trying to solve the same problem, the solution is inherently more innovative and um, more enriching. And so uh, what was really an ad advantage for me is making it very student led. Before each um, class, I'd always ask people who participated what their feedback is, what they were interested in. And really, as I was going along, checking in to make sure people were enjoying it and um, getting honest feedback on how I could improve really made the program a lot stronger, I think. Also making it about the people was very important. So allowing time for some social interaction and some connection in addition to art making was one of the best things that I think Tactile Art Club does. The third thing that I said would really work is to know your demographic and use that to base what you're doing. For example, if you have a demographic that really wants to know the um, practical applications of a certain art skill, it might be best to have a setup where you have um, formalized teaching and people are following along. That way they have a lot of guidance and they can feel like they're really mastering the subject. On the contrary, I found that um, this is generalizations, but um, generally younger kids and uh, kids that uh, are just doing art as a hobby really want to uh, explore for themselves and kind of take their own creative liberty. So in that case, you might um, give like general suggestions, but just let people experience it on their own. It's important to recognize that there is really no right or wrong in art. And so, um, allowing each person to make something unique, I think is very valuable. Another thing is basing your demographic on how you structure. For example, if we had a smaller group that uh, wanted to create a more intimate setting with conversation and discussion, 
then we were able to provide full material kits so that they would get exposure to different mediums. However, if it was a larger group, like sometimes in Tactile Art Club, we have like more than 30 participants at once, then in that case, it might be better to look at household materials. I think through this process, I realized um, the beauty of redefining what I perceived as art. And a lot of unexpected things can actually be the greatest mediums. And so um, household materials, I think, are a great way of making art accessible online. Finally, I think online documentation is super important and has allowed this um, thing to keep going because sometimes online uh, is hard to get as much engagement and um, participation. And so for that, what I've done is um, after each meeting or like major event, I write a blog post about it with all the like um, written transcript of the things we did. Um, so that way, if a person couldn't make it, they can still make art from their homes, as well as in certain cases, like museum workshops, we do post recordings as well, so people can follow along outside. I have also uh, worked on projects such as the Dairy Arts Grant, where I got to create uh, my own instructional videos that I posted online so that people can follow remotely. And now challenges and solutions. I think that the primary challenge I found was um, getting like all the materials because initially I thought that you had to have a whole like art studio to do art and um, with people in a lot different places uh, it was a little challenging to make art projects that were suitable for um, people at home. The solution to that I think is to one open the mindset a little bit on what could be art and two look at the specific medium you're looking at and see if there's any at-home alternatives that you can use if shipping's not an option. For example, I really uh, knew that students love clay because the texture is very hands-on and it's very tactile in nature, but if we were doing it at home, we kind of solved this issue by making our own salt dough clay. The great thing about the internet is that you can find almost any information on there if you want to. So if you have a specific medium in mind, it's a lot more direct to find a tactile alternative. Another challenge I think I faced was having people continuously show up and having steady participation because I know scheduling can be a challenge when it's online. And naturally, uh, with Zoom fatigue and everything, I understand that online isn't quite the same level of enthusiasm and community engagement as it would be in person. Some of those challenges, I think, just naturally occur in any online area, but ways that I've tried to mitigate this include making community as a priority. Even if it's something like asking people to introduce themselves at the beginning and share their favorite food or something like that, getting people talking to each other creates that sort of comfortable atmosphere that makes people feel like they've found a community. And I think when people feel a sense of community, they want to come and they want to continue doing the art. So that was kind of all I had, um, but thank you all so much. Uh, if you'd like to connect with me, as always, I would love to uh, work with any of you. So my email, I will put all this in the chat as well, but rishigakartik at gmail.com. And then if you want to learn more about anything I said um, and a ton of information more that I didn't include, my website, blogs and personal art gallery are on my website. And now is Q and A. So thank you all so much. Do you have any questions for me? You can also ask Anne too, she's on the call. Oh, that's great. Yes, tinfoil sculptures are awesome. The great thing for tinfoil sculptures too is that there are tons of tutorials online. So I don't know how many seventh grade students you have, but if you have a small amount, you can ask them what they'd want to make. And then if one wants to make, I don't know, like their favorite animal and one wants to make a house or something, they can find their own, uh, tutorials and you can supplement too. So each person's making a unique project. So, okay, um, one, uh, just to begin, I wanna say that was really amazing and really opened my eyes to a lot of things that can be done. Um, I'm from a library, I'm a librarian with the Rado Public Library and I've started this adventure with Build a Better Book um, be right before the pandemic, <laughs> right smack before the pandemic and was really inspired. So um, we're this summer we're gonna do an online set of classes um, that are going to focus on tactile art, um, but we're working a lot with 3D pens 
and hopefully Tinkercad and then, you know, 3D printing. But when I, I'm seeing all of these like really cool art projects that you mentioned and you're working with artists. So one of my things is that I'm not an artist, right? So sometimes I think like, do I need to connect with an artist? in order to, to make it happen? Or should I feel you know confident that I can lead a tin foil sculpture thing? Hmm. That's a good question. I think that uh, first of all, <laughs> you definitely the uh, unique like printing thing. So there's a little bit of an echo, apologies. Um, but I think that you should definitely have confidence in the fact that you do have um, valuable artistic expertise that you can bring to your students. I think uh, just feel for kind of uh, what type of students they are, because if they're the type of people that will just like to get their hands on tinfoil and it gets their brains going, then I don't think you need much artistic exp expertise and anyone really can facilitate that because just by having students get that structure of this is the project we're doing and we're all working on it together, I think that'll enthuse them. For students who are taking art more seriously, perhaps they're uh, really interested in pursuing it as um, a passion or as a potentially like career option. In that case, then uh, maybe you'd like to connect with an artist and explore other uh, alternatives to give them a more like official feel. Does that make sense? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, apologies, you're muted. Uh, would you mind unmuting? I still can't hear you. Sorry about that. Okay, better? <laughs> yes. Okay, I can't believe after all this time, I still didn't know that. Uh, okay, so my name is Risi, and I'm here on the webinar with my colleague, Jillian Kofnas. Uh, we've Zoomed with Gigi and Stacy, and uh, I've also emailed um, Ian. And uh, we're in uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, in a private all-girls high school. And we, we're looking forward to starting in September, a uh, Build a Better Book Club curriculum for our sophomores. Um, they've had uh, a full, they will have had a full year of 3D design uh, using Fusion 360. So we're in the planning stages of trying to like build the curriculum. And um, my question for you is, you work with many visually impaired students. Um, what, what would you recommend and how we go about preparing our students in meeting the visually impaired children? Um, like, what do we, how do we prepare them, right? Um, and what's, are there like right ways and wrong ways in addressing them? And that, that's just a question that I have. Right, that's a good question. So I first, I'm gonna say that my answer is only based on my experience. And uh, because I'm sighted, I obviously recognize that I can't like speak for that community. But what I've heard from like the friends that I've made and things like that is that obvious, honestly, sometimes sighted people like overthink things. Like they get so into like trying not to be like offensive or appearing right that students feel a little uncomfortable because then the focus is kind of like on their blindness and not about who they are as a person. So. The best thing I'd say, obviously, um, you know, like tell your students uh, that, you know, these um, kids might do things a little differently, but it's still valid and, you know, all those sort of things. But to a certain extent, I think that um, just like letting people ask and like interact normally as you would any teenager is the best way to go because um, I haven't really encountered many um, blind individuals who said, oh, wow, that was like super offensive and um, I hate speaking about my blindness. A lot of times, uh, when sighted people ask, they enjoy talking about things, and I think it's a good way to um, exchange perspectives. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say. Just, uh, you know, in general, uh, encourage sort of understanding and open mindedness, and also just remind students that they're just kids like you. You know, they probably drink boba tea and watch too much Netflix, just like you. <laughs> Thank you, and and really, congratulations on on your your all your initiatives and uh, your. Um, excitement to bring all of this. It's great. Oh, thank you so much. And I'd like to just toss out a few more thoughts on that subject. Um, one of the things that I, I know that I do hear frequently is when people um, 
don't ask to uh, touch someone before they touch them. Uh, if you don't see them coming in, you know, it's it can be uh, off putting. So it's just polite to know to ask before you touch someone. And um, that that goes for uh, showing them something like across the room, uh, grabbing their arm or grabbing their cane um, is like, don't don't do that. <laughs> um, offer your elbow if you want to uh, walk across the room. Um, or, you know, if you want to show them something on a picture, uh, say uh, you can do the way I like to do it best is I point to the object that I want people to look at and then just say find my finger it's on the picture and then it's all completely controlled by the uh, person you know where their hand goes so that's just a nice way to uh, do it also the other thing about um, is uh, what kind of label do you want to be called by and you know I think that we're all getting a lot of practice in that but you know you just ask uh, what label you know what should I call you you know uh, how do you how do you label yourself? How do you um, refer to yourself? You know, a lot of people will um, are proud to be uh, labeled as blind people and want to be labeled as blind people. But a lot of times in um, more uh, formal settings, it, the person first language is so, uh, you know, important, a person who is blind rather than blind person. And um, that is uh, in a more uh, organizational setting. I think people tend to do that, but not all blind people like to be referred to that way. So it's just a ask kind of thing. Thank you. Those are such great points, Anne. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think the motto for everything is like, when in doubt, ask. Like, if you have a question or you have a doubt, just ask the person. <laughs> I saw a great question in the chat that says, can you say something about your digital art and how might you create an online or face-to-face -face experience? Great question. So digital art was, again, something that I kind of uh, stumbled upon. I was working on an independent project at school, and it was my teacher, actually, uh, who is wonderful and very talented, who said, oh, um, you're interested in, like, design and technology, uh, you might be interested in digital art. Uh, for context, uh, I'm also the AutoCAD lead at my school. So um, I'm interested in like AutoCAD and I'm currently learning SolidWorks as well. So I have that sort of background on the side. Um, but in terms of digital art, I think it's something where like, you take the same creative skills that you learn in traditional art and you just employ them in a different way. And I think that um, a lot of the like methodology of like teaching that um, is very much the same. So I know you asked about an online and face-to-face -face experience. That's something that I'm actually still trying to think about because I haven't yet done a workshop with like digital art for students or something like that, just because the platforms are kind of visual by nature. And a lot of the technological equipment can be a bit expensive for students to access. But I will say that if you're trying to teach a concept, for example, like programming or a concept such as um, like digital art um, in the sense that maybe you wanna teach people how to use layers. Maybe you wanna teach people how like a 3D coordinate plane can work. I think you can still create like physical models and uh, do like physical art projects that explain those concepts so that that way students have like hands-on understanding of that um, as they uh, learn technological skills. And I think the same could be said for um, sighted people as well. I know my favorite um, like tech related activities were things where I got to like build something or have something physical. So yeah. I hope that answered your question. Sorry, I couldn't give like a specific example, but yeah. So I Rashika, I was wondering if you could speak to that experience of trying to facilitate an activity, you know, through through Zoom or, or through a remote setting. I know that a lot of teachers have been, you know, kind of dealing with that all year in terms of how do you take something that normally you're used to explaining in person when you can you know go over to somebody and you can see the work they're doing and you can you know help them out or show them in person but trying to do that in an online space is a lot more challenging 
Um, and then working with students who are blind and visually impaired on top of that adds another layer, obviously, of a challenge there. So can you speak a little bit about, you know, how that has been and especially going from kind of an in-person to the digital space and then also, you know, any tips you found that work well to try and trying to like explain and facilitate activity is um, when you're not there in person. Makes a lot of sense. So I guess uh, I can answer uh, in general. And then if you have a specific aspect, such as like how to get students engaged or a specific concept, um, maybe I can answer more directly. But in general, I think that with online, um, with a population who some of them have uh, limited vision or no vision at all, uh, it's important that you rely even more on like audio clues in your words. So as someone who loves to talk to people, one of my drawbacks is that sometimes I ramble and go off topic. And so sometimes for a tactile art club, I'll pre-write what I'm going to say and uh, write it all down. And I'll try and uh, test run it before I go and do it. For example, if I have a friend uh, that has limited vision, I'll say, hey, um, maybe like take a look at this or I'm gonna say this to you. Does this make sense? Is this language specific enough? And that way you'll know that the students uh, will get the opportunity uh, to understand what you're saying. For example, at the beginning, uh, Anne gave me a lot of feedback, which is great. Um, I would say things like, take your paper and fold it. And she would be like, fold it how? Are you taking the top right-hand corner and putting it in the left-hand corner? When you use descriptive language like that, um, it makes it a lot easier for students. The second thing I would say in terms of like engaging students with participation is honestly, I feel like I've gone through like two separate phases. The first is like trial and error. So I'll try and find something that students are like, particularly I use this method with like kids or like teenagers um, because I think adults are more readily willing to talk, uh, trying to find something that they're interested in. And sometimes I'll say something, dead silence. That's okay. The awkwardness, <laughs> you can embrace it. But eventually you'll find something that people love talking about. And when you try and tie that thing to what you're doing, I find that it gets people a lot more excited and talking with each other. So for example, um, at Colorado uh, School for the Deaf and the Blind, I realized that a lot of my students were actually really interested in international travel, which is awesome. They were uh, wondering about different languages, the geography of different places, and they just really liked talking about that. So when we uh, did clay, I said, oh, if you want, you can make maps or make houses of your different interests. And from there, they got to ask each other, oh, where are you from? They asked me like, oh, how was your experience like in India? And like, I think that was a great learning experience too. So just finding an avenue where you can talk about something based on something your students are interested in is great. Another example is like pop culture, like taking an academic subject and tying it to something non-academic can be really great for involving people. So maybe people aren't really feeling school, but if you can tie what you're doing to like, the latest show on Netflix or like a YouTube video they've watched, I find that it's easier to have participation. Does that help? Do you have anything to add? That was great, thanks. <laughs> How do you handle different levels of expertise of online participation? Good question. So I think uh, first, um, I kind of get a gauge uh, beforehand on what like, kind of group is going in. So for example, if I'm working with the museum, I'll ask them, oh, have all of these kids worked with this medium before? Or like just asking ahead of time so that I can get a baseline. And then afterwards, usually in instruction, I'd like to give kids a few avenues and adults too, that they can pursue based on their level of comfort. So I'll be like, oh, if you want, um, and this is your first time, this might be something that is a little bit easier and that you can do more quickly. And then if you've already mastered this, then you can add this on top. So the beauty of having a project and um, having multiple like branch off paths that people can follow allows um, multiple participation. I also really like having students explain to each other because I think that you learn best from teaching others. And so if someone's already gotten something, for example, and they're a little bit more advanced, I might have them like step in and help the other students. Ooh, is there anything being done in the realm of virtual reality or augmented reality for the VI community? Short answer, tons. There's like tons of research, tons of projects. Um, I'm actually working uh, in a research study right now uh, with a professor on trying to create sort of like 
a augmented reality or like virtual environment um, for students so that they can practice um, cane training in a gamified way and make it less like stressful or like risky um, to navigate like common setups such as a school building or something like that beforehand. So I would say there is a lot of uh, research, but that's something that I'm looking to um, learn as well, because I think that we need to bridge the gap between what's out there and what people can actually use. Because um, I've had a lot of people tell me, for example, um, O&M instructors at um, CCB have told me that um, it's really important when you look at technology to ask the community that it's supposed to help first and foremost, like, is this useful? Because a lot of times, for example, people try and use all this fancy technology to replace the cane when the cane is actually uh, like a really big part in um, someone's day-to-day -day experience and uh, the message of Colorado Center for the Blind is actually encouraging people to use their cane rather than you know relying on other sources because it teaches independence. So first I would say uh, that's the thing if you're looking to develop that further. And the second is um, I'm interested in how we can make uh, VR and um, kind of augmented reality more cost effective for students too, so that they don't need all that much equipment and things uh, to access. So that's what I would uh, say with that. Also with virtual reality, um, the area that I know most about is like cane travel and um, O&M I would say is when I've seen it used the most, but if you have any more specific questions in terms of like examples of projects, I can definitely send out some technology that I know of or people that have done things in that field. Does that help? Yes, thank you so much. Absolutely. Can you talk about how you connected with museums and were able to set up workshops with them? Yes, definitely. So first, uh, I had a big help from uh, all the other wonderful people at the uh, committee for museum accessibility at NFB um, because I got to learn about different perspectives and learn more about what museums were looking for and kind of the museum perspective. After that, like, honestly, my dad has told me this um, and he's like my biggest source of life advice, but I think it's so true. When in doubt, just ask. Like initially I thought that museums would be so hard to reach. And so I never like took the initiative of emailing, but I found that like most times if you email like museums, they will respond back and they're excited to connect with you and become more progressive as institutions. So I thought it was actually uh, fairly easy to connect with museums. Of course, I have gotten like some cold emails as like I'm sure everyone has experienced, but the most part people are very um, accessible about trying to uh, work with you. Also, I would say um, for connection, it's helpful if you can one, state like what your expertise is and what specifically you try and bring. So having uh, something beforehand and two, talking about how it will benefit the museum because I know that financial strain can be a huge deterrent for creating these accessible programs, especially because the population is um, part of a minority numerical wise. So having some like evidence or statistics behind why you want to do what you do, I think will incentivize museums a lot to work with you. In terms of setting up workshops, I really just have to thank the museums. Like they are the ones who have been so open-minded in giving me that experience and allowing me to do it. So yeah, the museums I've been working with are fantastic and the people there are also awesome. Anything else? I was busy typing, but it's probably easier just to unmute myself. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess, what do you see for your own future? What what projects are you wanting to tackle? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, to be frank, I think I'm kind of someone who lives uh, very much in the moment. So I, 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 my future is kind of open, but I do know that this is a community that I'll always love and always want to work with. And I want to continue uh, like this mission and follow my values throughout whatever I do. I think that my ultimate goal for like myself and what I've started is to make it so that art really is accessible for all and branch into dis different disciplines. So I would love to see like more international participation. I would love to find ways to uh, incorporate what we've already done to different realms like digital art or like um, incorporating technology, I think. That's a big interest of mine as well as um, kind of a kid who's interested in STEM. 
And I also think that just expanding this work so that perhaps in the future I could have like a large team that's all working towards the same cause and um, both sighted and blind people working together to further the accessibility for all would be great as opposed to just, uh, you know, smaller scale initiatives. So I think my biggest plans for the future are scalability and seeing kind of where experiences take me. Rashika, hey, Mr. I, Jeff. Just, I just wanted to say thank you because anytime I feel like I'm overwhelmed and have too much to do, I remind myself that you're doing all of this and you're a full-time student and it's just really inspiring and really impressive what you're doing. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for coming. Mr. Gentry is um, a big supporter of mine at my school and I'm lucky that I've had so many like school supporters and uh, he's also been like the college counselor there among the million of other jobs that he has at our school for like the last 20 years. So thank you so much. It means a lot to me that you're here. You bet, Rashika. Anything else? I'm happy to answer questions. And like I said, I'm giving pretty general answers. So if anyone wants to connect with me, um, collaborate or just like chat one-on-one, -on -one, uh, feel free to contact me at my email or um, you can reach out through the website as well. All right, well, I guess if there aren't any other questions, then um, thank you so much, Rashika, for sharing so much expertise with everyone <laughs> and all of your thoughts. Um, I we will be posting this video on, on the Build a Better Book website, and I'll also be um, including it, some bio, biography notes from Rashika with a lot of links to a lot of the things that she talked about today as well. So there's more resources coming with that as well. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Rashika. That was terrific. It was great to hear all about your work. Okay. I hope all of you take care and yeah. Uh,